Greetings, folks. In the spring of 1997, we produced a video production called America's Judgments, What Lies Ahead. We were aware of Y2K, but at the time we did not take it serious enough to put it in our video. Not until we did our own investigation did we realize how serious it actually could be. But don't take my word for it. Let us share with you the, the uh, documentation that we have here, and you can make up your own minds. Uh, the Y stands for the year. Uh, two is for what it, exactly what it says, and K is for thousands, so Y2K would be the year 2000. From the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, we find some interesting comments. Uh, you own a cell phone, field irrigation equipment that follows a set pattern for watering, home appliances that depend on electronic calendar to make them work. Do you drive a tractor, a combine, earth moving equipment? Do you enter an elevator and expect to take you to the next floor? If the machinery in the plant where you work suddenly fell silent and refused to start again, would you still have a job? Do you go to a grocery store? Where do you think the food comes from? This is from uh, the United States Department of Agriculture. As I said, it says right on the headlines of the document that they've circulated throughout the country, why should I care? I don't even own a computer. Maybe it's time we all start wondering what's happening. You know, it's like the man that built his house upon the sand. This time it's called silica sand. From the Federal Computer Week, 5 November of 98, year 2000 tops agenda in DOD Pacific Command. DOD is Department of Defense. Honolulu, fixing the year 2000 database or database code glitches have emerged as a top priority in the highest ranks of the U.S. command, with concerns ranging from checking interfaces with South Korean telephone systems to fixing embedded chips and bulldozers. Our snowplow in Knox and Montana has chips in it. Lieutenant General Carlton Fulford, commander of the Marine Forces Pacific, called the year 2000 problem the number one challenge of his command. Guess he hasn't heard of what's going on in Taiwan lately. Colonel Jan Hicks, this is from the same article, Chief of Information Management for U.S. Army Pacific and Command of the 516th Signal Brigade, zeroed in on the lack of year 2000 compliance in commercial products as one of her primary concerns. She said the command in the past 14 months installed a new telephone switch system that turned out to be non-compliant. <coughs> Uh, July 8th of 1998, Glitch in Navy's combat system software knocks out weapons capability of first two cruisers to get the key upgrade. This is from the Virginia pilot. The cruisers Vicksburg and Hue City remain able to go to sea, but are unable, or unfit rather, for battle for up to two years. What does that say to our arch enemies? What a nice invitation. From the uh, Philadelphia airport, <coughs> um, it's hit by power outages, according to Associated Press. Uh, the date on that is uh, uh, the fifth month, the eighth day of 1999, according to Associated Press. The power failure knocked out traffic controllers, radar displays, and radio communications for 23 minutes at the Philadelphia International Airport. Of the six jets in the air at the time, FAA officials said that two landed safely on their own. Four switched to radio frequencies operated uh, by other control centers. Five planes on the ground also lost radio contact while waiting for takeoff instructions. And it goes on and on. I wonder, uh, Mr. Koskinen, if you're still going to take that plane on New Year's Eve. Uh, John Koskinen is the Y2K guru for uh, President Clinton's group. Uh, contrary to uh, growing uh, public opinion that the FAA is going to be the poster child of failed systems, I'm confident that the FAA system is going to work. In fact, I've announced I'm flying to New York on New Year's Eve in 1999, and I'll take the first plane back, commercial plane back, uh, the next day. Bankers prepare for a panic. Fear of electrical power outages and bank failures could lead to widespread panic as disruptive as the Y2K glitch itself, Senator Robert Bennett warned. Even if the Y2K problem is solved, the panic side of it can end up hurting as badly. The use of federal, or the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve is printing an extra 50 billion, that's OTA money, folks, out of thin air money. Where do they make that? Where do they get that? The first uh, creator of money has it for free, don't they? Uh, $50 billion of banknotes as a precautionary measure. The central banks of Australia and New Zealand have taken the same steps. Uh, Koskinen said the government would be moving from contingency plans to a crisis management phase. The urge to stockpile just to be safe is going to hit everyone. October 20th, 1998. 
filmsteads are preparing for the worst. I could see a lot of crime. I could see uh, looting and arson, burning, the kinds of things that happened in the L.A. riot. Olmstead, a computer programmer with 28 years of experience and a Ph.D. from Stanford, quickly came to the conclusion that extreme precautions were in order once he understood how widespread the Y2K problem really is. I thought he was really exaggerating and that it couldn't be as bad as he was making it out to be. And frankly, I went through all of those stages. I was angry. I was in denial. And then I realized once I started reading all of these things that were being printed from the Internet and mainstream articles, that there really was a problem and it wasn't going to go away. The Olmsted family recently made the difficult decision to purchase a gun. That's a big step. I'm not a gun nut. I don't really like guns. Uh, it's strictly a self-defense measure, and I would hope I would never have to use it. It would be an extreme situation that I would. Are you going to go and learn how to use it? Uh, yeah, we'll go uh, take some uh, lessons or whatever you do down at the firing range. We'll get to learn how to, how to use it and know how to use it. Your wife? Yeah, I think I'll make her do it, too. Your son? Uh, I know he would love to do it. If I bought hurricane insurance, then the hurricane didn't arrive. Or I bought fire insurance for my house, and the house doesn't burn down. You don't feel silly, you feel relieved. And that's what I would feel if everything works out fine. I'm preparing for the possibilities that it won't work out fine. Well, this is from Y2KNewsWire.com, January 15th of 99. Uh, they show a chart here. Uh, the description under the chart is... Uh, uh, the amount of money that's in circulation, the money that's obligated to the depositors and the reserves that the bank have to pay the depositors. <clears throat> the total in circulation here in the United States, uh, it's estimated by the Federal Reserve, is $480 billion. The total that depositors are owed here in the U.S. by the banking systems is $3.7 trillion. The amount of money that the banks have to pay you the depositor back is only 43.2 billion. It's like uh, 1.17 uh, cents on the dollar is all they have to pay you. It's quite a scheme they've got going, I would say. Now here's a larger version uh, of the same chart. Uh, we can't say blow it up anymore because that's politically incorrect. We have to say expand it. So we've expanded this so you can see just exactly what they're up to. <coughs> now there's a document that I'd like to share with you. It's uh, called the Cobden Club, Secretariat of the World. It happens to have Minority Speaker of the House Gephardt's phone number on it. Now, as you can see by the picture here, uh, Gephardt and uh, uh, Gore are rather embracing. You'd have to wonder what's happening behind closed drawers. Uh, excuse me, I mean doors. Uh, notice where Gore is looking, too. You wonder what's going on here. But anyhow, the document talks about, on page four, the rather bragging. This is the time to save the Anglo-Saxon race and its most glorious production, the Anglo-Saxon system of banking. You think that's glorious? With only a dollar and 17 cents for every hundred? Insurance and trade, it says. <coughs> now, uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, there's a man by the name of Dr. Edward Yardini. He's the chief economist uh, for the Deutsche Banks here in America. He's written a book, uh, published it uh, at the turn of the year, uh, 1999. It's called Year 2000 Recession, Prepare for the Worst, Hope for the Best. Now, the man's in quite a position to where he'd better know what he's talking about or keep his mouth shut. And I believe uh, he has good reason to say what he is. Uh, we're going to talk about the energy grid. And on uh, page uh, 131 of his document, it says, There are no longer any manual alternatives. The industry's Achilles heel is that it is virtually impossible to test the Y2K uh, compatibility because the system must be kept online all the time. An industry spokesman, Eugene Gerzlinek, told a congressional panel in June of 1998, you just can't say, I'm sorry, folks, but no electricity. August 11th, we're going to uh, be testing our system. Now, we uh, uh, addressed the uh, Montana State Legislature on Y2K, and uh, <coughs> we mentioned to them that uh, we don't believe that they can test the power grid without shutting it down, and, of course, they laughed at us. But when they got Montana Power up, they asked them that question, and Montana Power had to hang their heads and say, Trotman's right. So I guess we'll see what happens here. Uh, his document goes on uh, to state the uh, North American Electric Reliability Council, uh, known as NERC, uh, says this, Why didn't NERC start to assess the electric power system sooner? After all, the council does provide winter, summer, and special assessment uh, reports for systems conditions. 
In October of 1997, the Council even published a long-term study, Reliability Assessment 97 to 2000, or rather 2006. Amazingly, it did not mention the year 2000 problem. Why not? Weren't they aware of it? Uh, from the uh, North American Reli uh, Electric Reliability Council, uh, the document uh, dated January 11th of 1999, prepared for the United States Department of Energy, uh, I'd like to share this. On page six of their document to the U.S. government, the U.S. Uh, Senate, uh, the top heading says, "Government, uh, Federal Governments of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, number one of their list here, allow the industry to continue managing Y2K efforts. What does that mean, allow the industry? Does that mean that the federal government is going to take over the electrical industry here in America? Perhaps we should look a little closer. I believe it's already being taken over. The Department of Defense runs the power grid. It's called uh, uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Now, if you want to know about the rest of it, the telephones are run by uh, Navy Intelligence and Army Signal Corps. It's called WillTel. The Internet is run by DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So they've pretty well got the bases covered. Uh, <coughs> GPS navigational hits, uh, glitch hits Japan's cars. This is August 23rd of 1999. Uh, Tokyo, Japan, AP, uh, Newswire. Hundreds of people in Japan complained Sunday after their automobile navigation systems went haywire. The result, a glitch in the satellite system used in navigational devices worldwide. Embedded systems and the year 2000 problem. The other year 2000 problem, draft of 18 June 1999 by uh, a company called Shakespeare and Toe Counseling. On the page titled Abstracts, the uh, very first paragraph, it says this. There is another year 2000 risk. It is distinct from the more widely reported risk concerning uh, impending failures of computers and software that represent dates using two digits for the year. This risk involves real-time clocks and their interactions with associated embedded processors and logic arrays. Dedicated electronic control and monitoring logic incorporated into larger systems. These are essential to the operation of vast portfolio of infrastructures, from medical equipment to buildings, phone, security, heating, plumbing, lighting, to transportation, to financial networks, just and just-in-time delivery systems. What about a just-in-case delivery system, folks? 1% of the 50 billion microprocessors and microcontrollers will fail, it says, causing the system they control to begin falling around January 2000 and for the first few years of the next century. <coughs> Under the heading of impact, they go on to say, systems observed to be functioning normally after January 1, 2000 are not guaranteed to be year 2000 compliant. This may fail, or they may fail, years in the future, depending on when their internal clocks are set, their EPA date, it's called. And I'm told that uh, a lot of systems, if they're kept online all the time, uh, the, the time clock won't fail. It doesn't uh, happen until they shut it down and restart it again. So if you had an electronic problem with your, with your car that's got an electronic ignition, if you left it running for 20 years, it would probably wouldn't fail, but the minute you go to stop it and restart it again, you'd have a problem. It goes on to say the electric utilities face a risk condition known as systems black. System black is a state where every generating plant that belongs to a grid is shut down, including its designated hot spare. This spare is a detached operating plant held in reserve to supply power to other electric plants as they recover from a blackout. This recovery is normally accomplished following a bootstrap procedure using power supplied by the spare plant. However, this spare plant faces the same year 2000 risk as any other, hence the risk of the system black condition. The bottom paragraph, if one returns to the larger picture of the relationship between organizations, such as systems that follow, that allow for the just-in-time delivery of food and other services, one finds that these relationships are threatened. There will be failures. What is the impact on the effectiveness of a year 2000 compliant organization in a largely non-compliant world. <clears throat> June 18th of 1999 from uh, a local Missoulian in Montana. Glitch during Y2K's test spills 4 million gallons of sewage. Los Angeles Associated Press. 
a water reclamation plant malfunctioned during a Y2K test and spilled 4 million gallons of, raw, of sewage into a San Fernando Valley park. So I guess what they're saying, folks, uh, when it turns over to year 2000, you better grab your shovels. Also from the Missoulian, <coughs> year 2000 disaster not, Thompson Falls, which is a county seat for our county. Sanders County Director of Emergency Services, Martha Smith says, go to the last uh, phrase, we don't expect disruptions to last more than a few days or a week. Now, that was February 14th. In that same paper, paper, February 14th, we find Senate approves protection from Y2K lawsuits. Now, come on, folks. Which way are we going to have it here? Do we have a problem or don't we? Why are they passing laws to protect themselves from failures if you're not going to have any failures? U.S. Congress is doing the same thing. According to Associated Press, July 2nd of 99, Congress shields businesses from Y2K lawsuits. Why? There's not a problem. Now, from uh, Congressman Stephen Horn, <coughs> We find uh, um, on page 90 of Yardini's report uh, a chart that shows the systems in the federal government that are ready and what their grades uh, are for uh, the progress they've made. Social Security Administration got an A. The Department of Defense got a D. Hmm. Not so good. The Department of Energy got an F. So what's the relevancy of the Social Security system being ready if they don't have any electricity? I believe that's who produces it, the Department of Energy. <clears throat> now, there's a man by the name of Chuck Missler that lives over here in Idaho, uh, right next to us. Um, he's a former uh, corporate executive from Ford Motor Company and other corporations. He is an electronic genius in the computer field. And he's put together his own chart on Y2K compliance for various government agencies. Uh, he says that... Uh, Year 2000, early in the year, NS, or, or, uh, NASA will be ready for Y2K. FEMA will be ready for Y2K in mid-year uh, 2000, but not for emergencies. So what's the E in FEMA for, folks? Why? Health and Human Services, 2001. GSA, 2002. FAA, 2003. So lots of ruck there, Kaskinen. 2004, the Treasury Department, 2005, the Agriculture, 2010, Transportation, 2012, Department of Defense. Hello, China and Russia. The year 2019, Energy and Labor. The Y2K Millennium Bug Problem could have much broader implications. It could include the unraveling of our total global infrastructure. It could create social and economic upheaval, anarchy, civil unrest even political exploitation, the restructuring of governments. So we could be in some problem here if people are right. But I wonder, if, <clears throat> could there really be a problem? Why is the FBI canceling all their leaves? Uh, I had uh, told an agent that at the turn of the year, of, uh, in 98 to 99, and he just kind of laughed at me. A few weeks ago, he called me back and he says, how did you know? It's laying on my desk now. My leave is canceled. So maybe there's something to it. The last bit of this document, uh, by the way, it comes from... Uh, World Net Daily, it was July 8th of 1999. The last paragraph says this. It's a mess, concluded the agent uh, concerning the, F the FBI's Y2K preparation. They're very much behind. If it was a 72-hour snowstorm, you wouldn't bring out 12,000 FBI agents on standby and for the first time maybe in FBI history cancel everybody's annual leave for 20 to 30 days in the time frame. That's very significant. In my line of work, that's called a clue. Now from uh, uh, the Washington Post, uh, June 28th of 99, it says DC plans to mobilize workers for Y2K backup. Least prepared are local governments, and you may find that the computer bug hits hardest on the street where you live. Local governments all across the country have become dependent upon computers and microprocessors to deliver services. They open the valves at the waterworks and handle 9-11 emergency calls. They send out the tax bills and print the welfare checks. They make the traffic lights turn red and green. And all of those systems are potentially vulnerable to the Y2K computer bug. Had no illusions that you could fix all of the problems by the year 2000. Never. Never. All of the critical systems? Uh, we hope all of the critical systems, but we knew we would never fix all of the systems of all of those 68 uh, district agencies. No Please. time. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. You're so far behind, the only way to deal with the problem is to try and set up contingency plans, assuming things won't work. Contingency is, is, is prudent. 
a prudent methodology. The uh, Coast Guard uh, has has sent uh, their employees uh, a booklet on preparedness of Y2K. The, the front of it says Y2K. Are you prepared? And in the center of the book, it gives various checklists. Excuse me, for uh, <coughs> food preparations, water, heat, um, power, light, transportation. It covers all of their basics. And in the last page, is a very curious statement here I'd like to share with you. It says, uh, transportation, regardless of what else occurs, you will still need to be able to transport yourself and perhaps others from one place to another. Most cars are not affected by Y2K and will be able to drive. However, Y2K may affect traffic lights and gas stations. If so, expect traffic to move slower. Yeah, they're going to move quite a bit slower when there are gas, aren't they? Uh, United States falling behind Canada, United Kingdom on Y2K preparedness, December 15th of 98. Uh, this is uh, PR Newswire, December 15th, I said. Y2K, newswire.com, today blasted government leaders in the United States for an astonishing unwillingness to publicly acknowledge the reality of the Y2K problem and to warn the public to make preparations. With the Y2K uh, having now, I'm sorry, with the UK, the United Kingdom, having now warned its citizens to stockpile two weeks' supply of food, the United Nations planning Y2K SWAT response teams and Canada planning a national deployment of military forces to help alleviate Y2K disruptions, the White House has been strangely silent on the issue. <coughs> national Guard uh, is creating a new Y2K raid team for all 50 states, this according to World Net Daily. Uh, each team is to be made up of 22 full-time National Guard members and is, to, is prepared to deal with domestic threats from terrorist groups using weapons of mass destruction. So how did all this, this begin, folks? In the uh, <coughs> early 60s, I was in the military, and I know that from the late 50s into the early 60s, the military was using a system made by IBM called the Hollerith system, that I believe spelled H-O-L-L-E-R-I-T-H. -L -L -E it was a punch card system of, of uh, computers. It uh, didn't have much memory, but they refused to sacrifice their eight digits for the, for the date code. That means two for the, uh, for the uh, day, two for the month, and four for the year, so they could compute the year 2000 instead of the year 00. Now, the document that we have before us here is called Federal Information Processing Standards Publication Number 4, November 1 of 1968, announcing the Standard 4 calendar date. Name of Standard Calendar Date, FIPS Pub 4. Uh, <coughs> approved Authority, Bureau of Budget, Maintenance Agency, Department of Commerce, National Bureau of Standards. Implementation schedule, the standards will become effective on January 1 of 1970. What standard are we talking about here? According to the document, uh, under number three, explanation. This standard provides codes and representation for identifying the specific years, months, and days of the Gregorian calendar. Uh, Article 4.4, examples of calendar date coding are December 1, 1909 is coded as 091201. 31 January of 1964 is coded 640131. 1967 January 15th is coded 670115. Skipping down to Article 5.3, the codes and representations for year, month, and day, and ordinal day, which means the 77th day or the 99th day as you go through the year, may be used independently or collectively as required. The only condition which must be fulfilled is that the order must be maintained in a high-low sequence, i.e. year, month, day, or year, ordinal, ordinal day. Now that was back November 1 of 1968. <clears throat> so here we have the Hollerus system in the early 60s and late 50s, which... Uh, didn't have much memory, but they refused to sacrifice their eight digits. So here we have 10 years later, 25% closer to the Y2K horizon, uh, at least a thousand times more memory, and they're going to get stupid on us? What's wrong with that picture, folks? Something's wrong here. So here comes January of 1988, 
And we find the Bureau of Standards uh, doing a little bit of shuffling here. Uh, this one is called Publication 4-1, in which they require uh, the government going to go back to four digits for the year elements. Now, going to the next document here, uh, under 4.1, this revision supersedes FIPS Publication 4 in its entirety. So they sh it should have been made very clear to all agencies that we had a problem that we needed to go back to four digits for the year, back in January of 1988. So along comes FIPS publication change 4-2 in 1988. So we got 68, 88, and 98 to try to collect, correct the problem that they'd created, <coughs> what, four decades ago, I guess, three and a half decades ago. The implementation, implementation schedule in 4.2, or 4-2, this standard becomes effective November 15th of 98. Federal agencies should use the date format promulgated, promulgated by the standard to minimize disruptions to information technology services and to maintain ability to conduct business in the year 2000 and beyond. It's called CYA, I guess, huh? Now, the New York Times, I don't very often quote the New York Times. Um, have my own reasons, I guess. February 9th of 1999, Pogo's Revenge Remembered. The growing questions about behavior management highlight a paradox that computer programmers were among the first to realize. The year 2000 computer problem, also known as Millennium Bug and Y2K, probably should have been called something like the Pogo Syndrome a after the old comic strip that observed, we have met the enemy and he is us. After all, humans seeded the year 2000 problem into the technology landscape by using just two digits and programming dates, such as 99 for 1999. <coughs> now, uh, from Jim Lord, uh, he is a uh, computer expert. Uh, he's been in the field for many, many, many years, uh, including within government, uh, actually uh, in the U.S. Navy. Uh, he put out a paper called The Pentagon Papers for Y2K. Secret government study reveals massive Y2K problems in American cities. How many days could New York City survive without water and sewer services? How long would it take to evacuate 8 million people in the dead of winter? Skipping to the last of the first paragraph. What on Unthinkable devastation would be wrought on the global financial system. How might our enemies seize on the ensuing panic and confusion? Are these the crazed speculations of a Y2K alarmist? Not if you know what the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps knows. According to a June 1999 report titled Master Utility List, they believe total failure is likely for New York City's water and sewer systems because of Y2K problems. Now, he has uh, reprinted in his newsletter uh, the military's release of these particular cities. They have three categories, and the only cities that are listed here are the cities that relate to the U.S. Navy, uh, not a, an inner uh, city in the middle of the continent that the Navy's uh, not uh, rubbing shoulders with, because the Navy, for the most part, and most of our military uh, uses outside services for both their, their water and their sewer, uh, electrical, or, or you, you name it. So they have to be very uh, cautious and concerned about how the cities are doing with their supply. So the first list is a partial failure uh, being probable. The second list would be partial failures likely. And the third list of total failure is likely. And we will have that in our uh, uh, production paperwork on this presentation uh, for your viewing, if you wish. He goes on to say, the federal government is withholding the truth about Y2K for the same reason. They don't think we can take it. They think we'll panic and take all our money out of the banks, cash in all of our mutual funds, and bust the stock market bubble, burst the economic, uh, break the economic system <coughs> by hoarding everything in sight, incite turmoil, chaos, and riots. <coughs> there are many reasons why their strategy is wrong, but only two need to be mentioned. Number one, this country belongs to us. Number two, these people work for us. If something's wrong, we have a right to know, and they have a responsibility to tell us. Will the truth result in riots, shortage, and disruptions to the financial system? Possibly so. 
But if our financial reserve banking system and our just-in-time manufacturing and retail process, uh, processes are so dangerously fragile, don't we need to know now rather than in the middle of a Y2K crisis? I think it's real serious. Now from an organization called Year 2000 International Security Dimension Project Report. We'd like to share this with you. It's the brainchild of Vice Admiral Arthur K. Um, Trabrowski, President of the U.S. Naval War College. His statement is, how we view the whole enchilada. He goes into a, a whole extended list of the uh, progress or the uh, degradation of the Y2K process that's about to come on America. Um, he names the, uh, the various countdown phases. But I thought the most curious thing was our big picture approach, he calls it. Our project's focus, it shows a military base and it shows a wire uh, or firewall, he calls it, and then the world outside, realizing that all, almost all the military bases are very fragile and they're very much uh, dependent on the outside supplies. Y2K, a process view, uh, it's a chart <coughs> that shows a, a graduating uh, line that uh, goes up uh, beyond uh, the threshold of unknown. Uh, it comes from an area where the old rules, uh, obviously most people know them, to an area where there's going to be new rules, rules created. Uh, the network of instability and failures, and it goes to, to peak in the year 2000, and uh, it has two lines coming back out of it. You could, uh, I guess, depending on how it unfolds, pick one of the two. One goes back down to normal, and the other one just kind of goes out along the, th the unknown threshold. Uh, he's also produced uh, another uh, chart that's... Uh, in a Navy document that was released just recently, so we know it's it's for real. It's called the New Era, New Rule Set. Uh, the systematic stress of World War II, new, new rules were created. Uh, but for this uh, problem that's coming along called Y2K, uh, it's called New Stresses, with a question mark below it, and Newer Rules Set. So where are we going to end up after this? Is it possibly a, a done-by-design situation? We've got a couple of quotes we'd like to share with you from uh, world leaders. Uh, one was former President George Bush. Just before he left office, he made the statement, out of chaos shall come the new world order. Uh, David Rock, I like to call him Rottenfeller sometimes, Rockefeller, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nation will accept the new world order. Well, David, which one are we talking about here? Which crisis? Crisis management. And we've got a little document here. It's, it says, uh, Global Gathering by Internet and Radio International uh, uh, Telephone System. It's called Heaven on Earth. Uh, the picture is uh, a tower. Uh, I wonder if that could be the Tower of Babel with a lady's face off to the right-hand side. Uh, could that be Gaia? And that bird coming out of the ashes must be the phoenix. Uh, whose ashes is that? In the last page, it talks about the global gathering, a special theme will be added with the focus on a special gathering for December 25, 99 to January 7, 2000 in New Zealand, a 24-hour global celebration of Peace Day, December 31, 1999 to January 1, 2000. How many world leaders will be in that area there, away from America when we go into our chaos? Now, if you want to help your community, folks, you need to have community meetings. You need to start rubbing shoulders with your neighbors. If everybody's prepared, you're not going to have chaos. Start a little list. Uh, call it a critical steps for Y2K survival. Post it in your community centers or in your bulletin board in your post offices. Just work together. It's time America talks to each other. It's way overdue. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, now that uh, we perceive there may be a problem with Y2K and, the, and their dirty little tricks, what do you think government's doing about it? Perhaps we ought to have a look. From a Federal Emergency Management Agency, February of 1999, uh, the headlines read, Contingency and Consequence Management Planning for Year 2000 Conversion. Conversion? What are we converting from and to? A Guide for State and Local Emergency Managers. In the document, we find a few statements uh, <coughs> within the meetings. It says, uh, some, state, some states are reluctant 
to become too dependent on National Guard for disaster response because they believe that the National Guard might be preempted by national priorities. Ask any guardsman who pays them. The document also says available undamaged facilities may have to be augmented by tents, paradomes, mobile homes, and railroad cars. Railroad cars? Which railroad cars might that be? The document also says guards mobilization readiness based on Y2K hostile environment. Or you mean people might be a little upset because they can't get the money out of the bank, they can't get the food, their sewers don't work, they can't get any water? You think they'd be upset? How much more upset will they be if government doesn't tell them ahead of time what's going on? At previous hearings, officials also have raised the possibility of martial law in response to disruptions in electric power. Quoting John Hammery, which is the second in command of the Department of Defense, we are in the process of refining the list of assets that have utility and military support to civilian authorities. This is known as MSCA. Because Y2K is a special case of MSCA, or military support to civilian authorities, in that many concurrent emergencies may occur, special procedures may be required to ensure the most effective use of these resources. Oh my, what does that mean? On December 3, 1998, John Koskinen, which is the Y2K guru for President Clinton, said, in a crisis and emergency situation, the free market may not be the best way to distribute resources. If there is a point in time where we have to take resources and make a judgment on an emergency basis, we will be prepared to do that. The last statement is this. If there is no panic in your community, there will be no need to allocate resources. Grandfather, the militia movement is spreading the word about Y2K preparedness, and he was in Reading today. While he isn't necessarily predicting doomsday, John Trockman says more people need to be ready for the party to end when 1999 does. Trockman has traveled the country speaking about Y2K, including appearances in front of the U.S. Senate. He's also appeared on This Week with David Brinkley. Trockman says communities need to take the lead to get ready for the new millennium. We need to, uh, we need to include all community members in this. If we leave one person out, that's one person that doesn't have food, that doesn't have someone looking out for them. And we should be especially mindful of those that uh, may be handicapped, or the older people and, uh, and the young, to make sure that everyone's watched out for. Uh, and I can't think of better people to do it than those that live right within the same community. From MSNBC, January 29th of 1999, we find this. Does U.S. need anti-terror troops? Pentagon, FEMA at odds over plans for Homeland Command. Kind of reminds you of the movie America, doesn't it? That's America with a K. It was put together by ABC Television in the fall of 1986. It showed the invasion and takeover of this country. Uh, this document, uh, back to MSNBC. A battle is looming over the issue of creating a Homeland Defense Command, a military unit responsible for managing a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Now, let me ask you, managing, would that be like managing a ball team? They want to manage the terror instead of stop it? Oh, yeah, that's right. Out of chaos shall come, said Bush. Now to, uh, to another little document we have here. Uh, this is from uh, Y2K Newswire, uh, 122.99. Amid charges of fear-mongering, independent organizations like Y2KNewsWire.com and Don McElvaney's intelligence newsletter have been warning the public for months to get ready for the soon-to-come domestic terrorism attacks on U.S. soil. Today, President Clinton declared such an attack highly likely and warned that a biological terrorist attack could spread from city to city, kind of like, he said, the gift that keeps on giving. Why would he call it a gift? You see one of these folks that's for population reduction also, like Ted Turncoat Turner and the rest of this group? Little did anyone know that very day, countless New Yorkers became victims of a biological attack. And the enemy was Uncle Sam himself. The army was spraying American citizens without their knowledge, without their consent. Professor Leonard Cole says long before Saddam Hussein threatened to use biological weapons against us, our own government used germ warfare on the American people as part of a top-secret nationwide test.
From the confined spaces of the bustling New York City subway system, where undercover agents shattered light bulbs full of bacteria onto the tracks, to the wide open air of San Francisco. For an entire week, government operatives in a ship offshore unleashed two types of germs on the population here. The bacteria then spread 20 miles inland thanks to the swift breezes off the San Francisco Bay. Here, agents with specially equipped briefcases experimented at the airport. They sprayed unsuspecting travelers with organisms believed by many to be dangerous. Imagine countless people possibly infected, then taking off for destinations around the world. From South Dakota, we have a, another article, Rapid City Journal, Thursday, September 17th of 1998. South Dakota National Guard plans for mission change. Coming to Camp Rapid and Custer is the 235th Military Police Company. It is a 124-member unit that will provide security guards for U.S. military facilities. Excuse me. Ellsworth Air Force Base has had their own guards for many, many years. Why would they need some newcomers? And military police who will oversee prisoners of war and civilian internees. Hmm. I wonder who that is. We've... Uh, had lots of pictures sent to us from around the country that show portable prison cells <coughs> um, being produced in Pennsylvania at a little concrete factory. Uh, at least this is one that we know of, uh, rolling down the interstates in various uh, parts of the country to be stashed away or put underground in other facilities uh, for instant prisons. I just find it very curious. Uh, we have military uh, uh, manuals that uh, show us how they've set up this internment system. Uh, I just think it's very curious how this is all coming together like a, a hand in a glove, all because of Y2K, as though they never thought of it before, folks. In a document titled FM 19-40, that's Field, Field Manual 1940, Headquarters, Department of the Army, February 1976, says this on the cover. Enemy prisoners of war, civilian internees, and detained persons. In the document, it talks about uh, the various civilian internees. Uh, <coughs> they may then be reclassified according to their true identity and ideology. It talks about putting prisoners of war to work. It tells how to build the, uh, the, the prison camps for them. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because I believe we are at the uh, point in time where they will be activating things like this in this country. The reason I say that, folks, is because of all of the portable prison cells that we've found here in America being produced and transported all over the country, uh, all of the uh, uh, various uh, uh, prison systems that are being produced, all of the white cars that are being uh, left parked here and there uh, by the hundreds and hundreds. Uh, there's got to be something going on that's above and beyond the call of duty of today. We know that crime is, uh, is dropping according to the, the FBI uh, statistics in America. So why this preparation? For what? What's going on behind our backs here? Uh, we also have uh, uh, white buses uh, that are being produced uh, by Bluebird Bus Company at least. Uh, we've got plenty of documentation to show you this. Uh, it has the emblems of the buses on them. Uh, it has uh, the UN uh, letters, UN, right on the side of the bus. Uh, nice white buses. Uh, the buses have uh, captain's chairs in them uh, with houndstooth pattern on the chairs. Now, I've got to ask you this. Uh, this article here appears from the Orlando Tribune. It's called Safe Passage, March 18, 1999. It shows uh, military personnel uh, kind of roughing people around here uh, as they sit with their faces buried in, the, buried in this captain's chairs in these buses. The caption below says, Mar Marines put refugees on a bus, then later into a helicopter at the Concord Weapons Station where urban warrior maneuvers took place Wednesday. There's something really wrong with this picture. If you want to find out how wrong this picture is getting, folks, uh, uh, ask for a copy of our newsletter called martial law, the road to slavery revisited, because we are going to be revisited, uh, revisiting where we've been in the past with the war against the South, etc. 
and who is going to be visiting us with their uniforms. So we've often thought that this would all be brought about by uh, United Nations troops, but with uh, apparently all the particular hell that we've raised about UN, UN, they're starting to change the, their, their skin, their chameleon skin just a little bit and calling it NATO. But you must remember, April 4th of 1949, NATO was created out of the UN. NATO stands for North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO summit to send a message. This is from our local Missoulian newspaper, Friday, April 23rd of 1999. It shows a picture of Washington, D.C., uh, where they're going to have their meetings and the security, etc. The last paragraph is very revealing. NATO leaders came to Washington seeking a new mission for the alliance, which was formed a half century ago to prevent Soviet invasion of Europe. With that threat removed, the alliance is casting about for a new purpose beyond its national or its traditional collective defense against threats to any neighbor. NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And here is the, uh, the symbol that they wear. <clears throat> and I think it's rather disgusting to see a color guard holding both flags, the uh, U.S. flag and the NATO flag, together with one hand. Uh, this came from the Spotlight uh, newspaper, May 10th of 1999. It's very curious that the symbol that they have of the four-pointed star with the exception of being in reverse, matches uh, the symbol that the Gosha map people use to depict uh, all points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. So if NATO stood for North Atlantic Treaty Organization and they've had the symbol of the compass, obviously their motives must have been a little uh, sinister. Where are they going with this? <coughs> this is from uh, John A. Quinn, Newshawk Incorporated. Uh, the headlines read, Was NATO on the scene of the Littleton Massacre? In what this reporter feels is some of the most bizarre, disturbing, unexplainable, and chilling news yet about the Columbine High School shooting incident is news that a large NATO truck, possibly more than one, and obviously at least some NATO troops, were reportedly present at Columbine High School in minutes after the shooting broke out. Now, going to another argument, just to substantiate what we're trying to get across here, Columbine Research Task Force, or CRTF, I'd like to quote a little bit from their document. They, uh, they are saying that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents were seen prior, during, and after the shooting, uh, specifically on the roof of the school and inside the school. They were observed on the roof of the school shortly after or shortly before 11.21 that morning by four neighbors across the street from the school and by at least 12 students, all of whom have given sworn statements to this fact. The ATF agents were seen dropping through the roof into the school at approximately the same time the shooting started. Going on with the same document, <coughs> two ATF agents were observed planting three of the five propane bombs. After the school had been thoroughly searched twice by all, law, by all law enforcement personnel, a captain and a sergeant of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department witnessed the ATF agents placing the bombs in the school. Within 20 minutes of the beginning of the shooting, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, a two-star NATO general, the ATF, FEMA, Federal Emergency Man Management Agency, and an M-16 armored personnel carrier. I know the agent and was quite surprised at his interest. We're on, his interest was on the bloody scene. Now, how in the hell is that possible? This was a state matter. What were all those feds doing there? <clears throat> this is from one of the investigators. So to add a bit of credence to what we just shared with you with uh, Columbine High School in Colorado, let me show you this from Modesto, California. The Modesto Police Department in black uniforms with a black truck behind them and a black uh, body armor shield that says NATO on it. Now the second picture shows much more clearly the NATO words right across the top, N-A-T-O in police near the bottom from Modesto, California. So what's this country coming to? Obviously, they're shifting gears a little bit. But the, uh, the American uh, military is not supposed to exist, so I guess they have to try to figure out another way to do something here. 
according to a document called Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World, um, it was uh, supposedly, and I question this, uh, signed into law by President Kennedy September of 1961. The reason I question is because Kennedy, uh, his ideology, his thought process, and some of the speeches he gave does not fit this document. Uh, this document um, talks about three different uh, disarmaments, and we're going to worry only about the third stage of the disarmament because we are way in the bottom of, of stage three right now. Stage three. During the third stage of the program, the states of the world, states of the world, building on the experience and confidence gained in successfully implementing the measures of the first two stages would take final steps toward the goal of a world in which states would remain on, uh, states would retain only those forces, non-nuclear armaments, and establishments required for the purpose of maintaining internal order, which of course does not include our right to keep them by arms, does it, folks? The UN peace forces, equipped with uh, agreed types and quantities of armament, would be fully functioning. The manufacture of armament would be prohibited except for those of agreed types and quantities to be used by the United Nations Peace Forces and those required to maintain internal order. All other armament would be destroyed or converted to peaceful purposes. Now, going, going back in time a little bit further here to 1943, Vice President Henry A. Wallace, uh, Vice President under uh, Roosevelt, wrote a book. This is 1943. It's called Century of the Common Man. On page 58 of the book, there's something that's rather curious. Now, bear in mind, this is two years before Congress uh, had it shoved down their throats and it finally got signed into law or, or treaty, treaty here in America. Page 58. No businessman can plan for the future with any certainty as long as there is the fear of war on the horizon. It is vital, therefore, that the United Nations Covenant must provide the machinery to assure freedom from fear and international peace law an international peace court and an international peace force. If any aggressor nations take the first step toward rearmament, they must be served at once with a cease and desist order and be warned of the consequences. If economic quarantine does not suffice, the United Nations Peace Force must at once bomb the aggressor nation mercilessly. I give you Kosovo. Now, from a, a man that's an author of a newsletter, um, <clears throat> this uh, particular one's called Heads Up by Doug Plater. There are two field grade and two company grade officers from other countries who read this newsletter regularly. That is because we are friends. We, meet, we met by accident a few years ago while they were acting as tourists for a few days before an important work-related business meeting. And because I wanted to brush up on their language and they English, we have spent a few hours together over the past few years. Uh, some of the things they shared. The UN and martial law were on the front burner. There are not enough US troops to enforce martial law in this country unless people passively allow it, were their statements. When I mentioned that many Americans fear that their guns will be confiscated, I was laughed at. The reply was something like this. One at a time, yes. All together, at once, never. See how important it is to stick together, folks? So I asked straight out, do you think we are to have martial law? After a bit of discussion, the answer was probably yes in some form. The reasoning, however, did not deviate at all from many things we and others have been reporting. That is, committees from both House and Senate have already called for martial law and questioned the Pentagon on its readiness. All military leaves are canceled. So too are the vacations of any and all armed federal officers. The National Guard and Reserves will be on alert, and all police departments will be at their full manpower. Clearly then, someone expects to have massive force available for something. Bottom sentence. Therefore, my friends, it is time to get body, both body and skills, up to par. Whatever the threat may be, we are, we are the initial home defense. From the New York Times again, January 28th of 1999, Pentagon seeks command 
for em emergencies in the U.S. The Pentagon has decided to ask President Clinton for powers to appoint a military leader for the continental United States because of what it sees as a growing threat of major terrorist strikes in, America's, in American soil, Defense Department officials say. The plans call for the military leaders to be ready, if necessary, to do such things as order thousands of doctors, stretchers, and emergency personnel quickly sent to a stricken area, much as American commanders abroad are now prepared to do. To do. The same document, Dr. Hemery, which is the second in command of the uh, Department of Defense, told military officials, if there is a biological attack, you can easily see regional governors, not state governors, regional governors, like the movie America, the regions of America, calling out to the National Guard to quarantine the highways. It could get crazy very fast. The danger is in the inevitable expansion of that authority so the military gets involved in things like arresting people and investigating crimes, said Gregory T. Noljim, uh, Legislative Counsel for National, Secu uh, National Sec Security of the American Civil Liberties Union based in Washington. Soldiers are trained to kill, not to respect the nuisance of law enforcement, New James added. It's hard to believe that a soldier with a suspect in the sights of his M1 tank is well positioned to protect that person's civil rights. Now, speaking of law and martial law, there was something created back in 1863 called the Libra Code, Instructions for the Government of Armed Armies of the United States in the Field, General Order Number 100, promulgated into law April 24th by Abraham Lincoln. It has 157 articles. The first article is titled Martial Law. And what it says is a place, district, or country occupied by an enemy stands in consequence of the occupation under the martial law of the invading or occupying army. Whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to the inhabitants has been issued or not. So don't expect them to tell you when it hits. Article 3. Martial law in a hostile country consists in the suspension by the occupying military authority of the criminal and civil law and of the domestic administration and government. Hmm. Article 4. Martial law is simply military authority exercised in accordance with the laws and usages of war. Article 5. Martial law should be less stringent in a place or, or countries fully occupied and fairly conquered. Much greater severity may be exercised in a place or region where actual hostilities exist or are expected and must be prepared for. Article 7. Martial law extends to property and to persons, whether they are subjects of the enemy or alien to the government. Article 10. Martial law affects chiefly the police and collection of public revenue and taxes, whether imposed by the expelled government or by the invaders. So don't expect the IRS to seize just because uh, Y2K happens. Article 15. Military necessity admits of all direct destruction of life or limb of armed enemies and of other persons whose destruction is incidentally unavoidable in the armed contests of the war. It allows for the capturing of every armed enemy and every enemy of importance of the hostile government or of particular danger to the capture. It allows for all destruction of property and obstruction obstruction of the ways and channels of traffic, travel, or communication. I guess the old book said your highway shall lie desolate, didn't it? And of all withholding of sustenance or means of life from the enemy. Article 157, the very last article, quite a way to wrap it up here. Armed or unarmed resistance by citizens of the United States against the lawful movement of their troops is levying war against the United States and is therefore treason. So who's the lawful troops today? That's why I showed you Disarmament Treaty 7277. There's no longer any U.S. troops, folks. It's those peacekeeping forces. Now, from uh, the United States Senate, 
uh, ordered to print uh, April 14th of 1976. Supplementary detailed staff reports on intelligence activities and the rights of Americans. Intelligence activities, United States Senate. On page 87 of almost a thousand pages in the document, near the bottom we find this. Persons to be listed in section A of the reserve index are described by the FBI as people who in time of national emergency are in a position to influence others against the national interest or are likely to furnish material financial aid to subversive elements due to their subversive associations and ideology. The types of persons to be listed in Section A included professors and teachers or lawyers, or I'm sorry, leaders, labor union organizers or leaders, writers, lecturers, newsmen, entertainers, and others in the mass media field, lawyers, doctors, and scientists, other potentially influential persons on a local or national level, individuals who could potentially furnish material financial aid.